Welcome to Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich. The Heavenly Calling. By James Boyd. Part 1 of 2 Parts. These papers are written to show the error of the teaching that the church will go through the Great Tribulation and that only certain of the saints will have part in the Lord's Kingdom and glory. I am thankful to be able to say that on the subject of the heavenly calling of the saints of the present dispensation of grace I have nothing new to which I may call the attention of the people of God. For it is not only plainly set before us in the word of truth, but it is a subject to which our consideration has often been called by faithful servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. My only reason for writing this paper has its foundation in my desire that the minds and hearts of believers should be kept in the simplicity of the glad tidings which on every hand are being assailed by the powers of darkness, a miserable substitute for those life-giving verities being zealously and vigorously propounded. This is a day in which the restless and lawless activities of the human mind under the influence of the devil are engaged in the invention of fables, which are foisted upon us with all the energy and force of him who never wearies in his warfare against the truth of the living God, and if texts of scripture perverted and torn from the setting in which they are placed by the Holy Spirit of God, can be found to give an apparent support to their accursed theories, so much the better. To bring the true light of God to bear upon the smoke that rises so darkening front the abyss of evil which as the dispensation draws nearer its close, increases in density, is the work of the true servant of the Lord. And first of all it might be well for us to look into that which is the great subject of the preaching. What is presented to me in the Gospel? having accomplished the work of redemption, and just before he ascended up on high, our Lord tells his disciples of the necessity of his death and resurrection, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem, Luke chapter 24 verses 46 to 47, and in the Acts of the Apostles we see how faithfully they carried out this mission. Peter says to him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believes on him shall receive forgiveness of sins, and Paul, be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, Acts chapter 10 verse 43, 1338-39. To the Corinthians he says that the gospel he had preached to them, and which had been the means of their salvation, was that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1-4. to The coming of Christ to judge the world was also preached, as also the establishment of his kingdom here upon earth. What, then, is the outlook of the believer? The immediate prospect placed before us is the kingdom, which shall be established under the reign of the Son of Man when he shall appear in glory. In the Old Testament the coming of the Messiah, and the setting up of this kingdom under his authority, were kept ever in view. His rejection and crucifixion set aside this kingdom, in the way in which it had been at all times viewed by the people of God, not thus forever set aside, but for a time. Hence we have it at this present time as the result of the preaching of the word, including within its compass all that call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, that is, all who outwardly acknowledge his lordship. I say, outwardly, because both at this present time and during his reign there are to be found many, who call him Lord, to whom he shall say, I never knew you, Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23 where his authority is owned on earth, there the kingdom is, although the king be hidden from the eyes of men. When it shall be established in the presence and power of Christ in the age to come its mystery character shall be over, and the subjects of Christ, who now suffer both with and for him, shall share his glory and reign with him. And all his true people suffer in both these ways. They suffer with him, by the fact that they have his nature, and must feel the evil of the world as he felt it, not to the same measure, I need scarcely say and not in a like measure do they all feel it together. Some perhaps feel it as Abraham felt the idolatry and evil deeds of those from whom he was called to maintain separation, and others as Lot felt the evil of those with whom, alas, he foolishly mingled, and whose righteous soul was daily vexed by their evil deeds, 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 7 to 8. I fear there are many more Lots today than there are Abrahams. Still, all true believers suffer with him, and therefore shall they reign with him, Romans chapter 8 verse 17, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12. In these days not so many are called to suffer for him, at least to any great extent. This is the immediate prospect before us, for, whatever else may lie beyond the thousand years of the reign of Christ, the way into it all is through the kingdom. We are to walk worthy of God, who has called us to his kingdom and glory, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 12. This is not that which we read of in Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 to 4.
for this new heaven and earth we look, and it is held up before us as light and encouragement for our hearts. But into this we pass through the kingdom to which we are called. We are called to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 14, and having been justified by faith we boast in hope of that glory, Romans chapter 5 verses 1 to 2. Waiting for the coming, Apocalypse, of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7. Ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 9 to 10. Keep this commandment unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 14, looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Saviour Jesus Christ, Titus chapter 2 verse 13. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory, Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. This is the attitude in which the Gospel sets the believer, to wait for God's Son from heaven in whom we have found a deliverer from the coming wrath, giving him the most perfect assurance that when he shall appear we shall also appear with him in glory. Not a true believer shall in that day be wanting. Let us now look at what is said about the wrath to come. The wrath to come. The scriptures set before us wrath both governmental and eternal, and it is well to be clear in our souls regarding this solemn subject. The wrath that fell upon the Israelites in the wilderness did not of necessity reach beyond the death of the body. It would be foolish to suppose that all who came out of Egypt of twenty years old and upward, and whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, were forever lost. What about Moses the man of God, and Aaron the saint of the Lord? 1 Chronicles chapter 23 verse 14, Psalm chapter 106 verse 16. Yet he says, I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest, Psalm chapter 95 verse 11. This wrath was exclusion from the land of promise, and raised no question regarding their eternal relationships with God. But of the wrath that is yet to come we have a great deal in the writings of the prophets. See Isaiah chapter 13 verses 6 to 16, Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 15 to 18, Amos chapter 5 verses 16 to 20, Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 3 verse 7. All these passages, and many others, speak of the preliminary judgments, which shall be the most terrible of all the woes that the evildoers of the earth have known. Of this wrath the nation of Israel shall be made to bear the brunt, but no nation shall altogether escape. It shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth, Revelation chapter 3 verse 10. From this hour of temptation the church shall be kept. From this wrath believers have found a deliverer, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10, even Jesus, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, Romans chapter 5 verse 9. The way in which Jesus would deliver the saints from this wrath had evidently not been told them. They had found a deliverer in Jesus, and this had set their hearts at rest, but how that deliverance was to be effected, we learn from the fourth chapter, they knew not. When the flood came upon the antediluvian world Enoch was not there, having been previously translated. Noah, who represents the Jew, has to go through the judgment, but is saved through it. Enoch was not there at all when it fell upon the world. In like manner the church shall be translated before the hour of judgment comes. It is not only that it shall not perish in the execution of that judgment, it shall not be here in the hour in which it falls. This hour ushers in the judgment of the living, which shall continue throughout the thousand years of his reign, for he must reign, till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 25 to 26. The judgment of the dead is the last judgment, and is after the thousand years are finished, and after the heavens and the earth have passed away. This is the day in which God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to the gospel preached by Paul, Romans chapter 2 verse 6. The first resurrection. I read in scripture of two resurrections, and of only two, that of the just, and that of the unjust. The first is a resurrection from among the dead that is, the resurrection of a select number, leaving the rest of the dead undisturbed. The disciples could not understand what the Lord meant by the rising from among the dead, Mark chapter 9 verse 10. They had no doubt about the resurrection of the dead, but the resurrection from among the dead went far beyond their intelligence. Martha says of her brother Lazarus, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day, John chapter 11 verse 24. A general resurrection was held by the Orthodox among the Jews, which was to take place when all should be raised together at the last day of this present age. The first resurrection is from the dead, and it is, of life. All who have received life by the quickening power of the Son of God shall be in this resurrection, the first and larger part. When he puts forth his power to gather up the church to meet him in the air. 
then he shall raise all his own in incorruption, power, and glory, chain to living, and call us up to meet him in the air. But during the time between this event and his appearing to the world when he comes to reign many will have lost their lives for the truth under the reign of the beast. And in the first resurrection they shall have part, in order to their reigning with Christ in his kingdom. When this takes place the statement is made, this is the first resurrection, Revelation chapter 20 verse 5. None are included, as raised at this time, but those who have been slain under the persecutions that will succeed the taking up of the church. But we are told by a well-known writer on this subject that this first resurrection is a special reward for high attainments in Christian virtue, and that Paul was not certain that he would be in it. But to share in that he was straining every nerve. Philippians chapter 3 is referred to. What is it that is before the apostle's mind? It is the great fact that he was called to be like Christ in glory, and having learned something of his moral excellency, his whole spiritual being pressed forward to reach the goal. He well knew that every saint of God would arrive there as soon as himself, but not in that fashion did he reason, he could not settle down in a leisurely mood, comforting himself with the thought that whatever efforts he might make, he could not have the prize until everyone else had it as well as himself. If he had had the slightest doubt as to the final results, his energies would have been altogether paralyzed. He had been apprehended by Christ to be conformed to his image, and there was only one of two ways by which this could be accomplished, by remaining here until Christ came, or by death and resurrection. He chose the latter way, for his desire was that he might know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. The way that Christ took was the way he desired to take, as the means by which he would arrive at the resurrection from among the dead. This was the way he desired to reach the goal, conformity to Christ. By this means he would apprehend that for which he had been apprehended by Christ. Everyone that is taken up by God in grace, God has this end in view for him, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Romans chapter 8 verse 29. And this is just that which Paul was after, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. The path to this goal rises before his vision, a path his feet were already treading, the highway to that high calling. And not only is the goal itself a mighty power of attraction, but the highway to that goal. A highway that bears the impress of the feet of the one who was the object upon whom he had set his soul, was in his heart, and at all cost to himself, and by any means. He would tread that path, know the fellowship of his sufferings, become conformable unto his death, share in the resurrection from among the dead and reach by this highway conformity to the Christ who had apprehended him for this very purpose. There is not a word about the kingdom in the whole chapter, nor a thought of it either. Nor indeed could one gather from the epistle that a kingdom was to be set up on earth under the reign of Christ. The subject of the epistle is Christ, and the goal before the believer is to apprehend that for which he has been apprehended by him. In chapter 1 the subject is the preaching of Christ, in chapter 2, moral conformity to him down here, in chapter 3, perfect conformity to him in glory. Which shall be reached when he changes these bodies of humiliation at his coming again, when we shall forever bear his image, in chapter 4, Christ as Lord and Administrator of God's riches in glory. Exhortations to the saints to be occupied with the things that are good, that the God of peace might be with them, also to be careful for nothing, but to make their wants known to God, and that with thanksgiving that the peace of God might guard their hearts and thoughts by Christ Jesus. Of the kingdom we have no mention. It is another subject that is before the heart and mind of the apostle. I take it that what we have in Revelation chapter 20 verses 4 to 5 is the completion of the first resurrection. We get the early part of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 42 to 58, and these are said to sit upon the thrones, and to have judgment given to them. But the saints slain after the rapture of the church are not to lose the kingdom, but are to share in the first resurrection. Therefore I read, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image. Neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. And those who have part in it are said to be blessed and holy, and immune from the power of the second death. There is one thing certain, whatever else may be supposed doubtful, no resurrection can be found in Scripture previous to that which we have spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and this in Revelation chapter 20 verse 4. And whatever else may be said about it, in both these places we have a resurrection from among the dead, and I know no other resurrection that could be said to be first, or from among the dead. In this first resurrection the dead rise, leaving the other dead undisturbed. 
if this in Revelation chapter 20 takes in all that are in the first resurrection, not one of the apostles, prophets, or saints, from Abel down to the rapture of the church could be in it. This that is definitely called the first has none in it, but those who have been martyred during the preliminary judgments through which the world is called to pass between the rapture and the kingdom. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. The resurrection of the unjust. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Then, when the thousand years of the glorious reign of Christ and the saints with him have been completed, the rest of the dead are raised. This is a resurrection of the dead, but not from the dead, none now being left behind. This is the resurrection of judgment, the resurrection of the unjust. In this there are none, blessed and holy, none over whom the second death has no power. These are clothed, and yet naked, destitute of righteousness, and exposed to the judgment of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 3, a resurrection inglorious and hopeless. The voice of the Son of God shall bring these forth, but the sound of it shall be in the ear of every one of them as the roaring of the lion more terrible indeed than the thunder of the lion of the forest. And for the first time in their whole history those who here shall obey. The doom is certain, and long have they known it, for in Hades their utterly lost condition had been a continual torment to their unhappy spirits. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them, those inanimate and guiltless haunts of wicked spirits and men, rendered unclean by the presence and practices of rebels against the authority of God cannot endure the look of righteous indignation cast upon them by the Lord of glory, and vainly seek a hiding place. Peter in his second epistle speaks of this day, and says that the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books, according to their works. The whole sphere in which man under the power of Satan pursued his wicked career of hatred and rebellion against God. And in which all that God is in his hatred of sin and in his unspeakable love to the creature who was dominated by it came into perfect manifestation, a manifestation that shall fill the vast universe of blessing with glory. And every redeemed heart with unspeakable joy, has passed away before the throne of eternal righteousness, and in its place a throne of spotless purity, before which are assembled for judgment the whole generation of the sons of disobedience, whose hatred of God was perfectly displayed in the cross of his only begotten Son. The books were opened, and out of these books the dead were judged according to their works. What the result of such a judgment must be, can anyone who knows his own sinfulness and the righteousness of God have a solitary question? Every man, of them was judged according to his deeds. There was no escape for any soul. Every man must have his place in eternity according to that which his works merit. The man who has sinned under law shall be there, so shall the man who has sinned without law, Romans chapter 2 verse 12, so shall the hypocritical servant of Christ, the false apostle, the reprobate disciple, the self-deceived miracle worker, the corrupter of the truth, the modernist, the infidel, the Christless professor, the liar, the murderer, and the fornicator and that which the works of every man merit, that shall he receive. For none of these was there anything settled at the cross, they chose to answer for themselves, and the desire of their heart has been granted. They shall have an eternity of woe in which to lament their folly. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Death and Hades ceased to exist by the casting into the lake of fire all that were in that condition. Not a soul saved out of that vast multitude. Over all in this judgment the second death has power. It has been asked, why then is the book of life said to be there? My reply is, what answer does scripture give to your question? Oh, it does not say. Well, if scripture does not say, it is in vain to ask me. I should, however, gather from the little knowledge that I have of God's word, that it is there to show how thoroughly is reconciled the sovereign grace of God with the accountability of man. Only the works of men are the destruction, only sovereign grace saves. None in this judgment is the subject of electing grace. They would judge every man according to their works. Is there any soul who may read these words mad enough to suppose that, if his condition for all eternity was to be determined by his works, it would be anything but unspeakable misery? I would fain hope that the reader is well aware that his works merit nothing but eternal damnation. In thy sight shall no man living be justified. No one could be found in this judgment whose name was in the book of life. Where would be the consistency in placing names in the book of life from the foundation of the world, Revelation chapter 16 verse 8.
and in the end bringing them into judgment that they may receive eternal bliss or blame according to the merit of the deeds. Only the stupid mind of man could suppose such an absurdity. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word, and believes on him that sent me, has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life, John chapter 5 verse 24. It must be either works or grace that save. There can be no mixture, Romans chapter 4 verses 4 to 5. If a sinner turns to God through the cross of Christ, he there sees all his sins, and also the evil nature that produced the sins, condemned and set aside in divine judgment, Romans chapter 4 verse 25, 8 to 3. Not only that, but he now lives by the quickening power of God in a new and divine nature incapable of sinning, and all he waits for is to have his body changed and fashioned like the body of Christ. That he may be ever with the Lord, John chapter 5 verse 25, Colossians chapter 2 verse 13, 1 John chapter 3 verse 9, and Philippians chapter 3 verse 21, and then neither in nor about him shall there be anything but the work of God. And this shall not be judged by God, for he shall not judge his own work. Man could not be either praised or blamed for that which is done by God. The judgment seat of Christ. Have believers not to give account to God. Surely, all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body, according to that he has done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10. And seeing the effect that this manifestation would have upon himself, the hopeless condition of the sinner is brought home to his soul in such power that he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men, it had no terror for him, for, we have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world, 1 John chapter 4 verse 17. We have no reason to fear the disclosures of that judgment, for the love of God has sent the Son that he should be the propitiation for our sins, and that we might live through him, 1 John chapter 4 verses 9 to 10. And not only that, but that mighty love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, Romans chapter 5 verse 5, and it will never leave us nor will it have its perfect satisfaction until we are in the likeness of Christ. Therefore fear has been driven out of our hearts. He that fears is not made perfect in love. The love and the fear cannot both dwell together in the same heart. His perfect love drives out the fear. The judgment can be looked forward to with the utmost tranquility. Indeed no true heart would wish to be without this manifestation, for there has been much in all our lives that we have little understood. Then we shall know as we are known. We shall see our failures in the light of infinite holiness and righteousness, and along with all the provocation with which we have vexed his Holy Spirit. We shall see the patient grace and boundless love that bore with us in our wanderings, and which kept us for himself in spite of the evil nature that could be so easily wrought upon by the devil, and which we so sadly failed to keep in the place of death. Instead of being a terror to us, it is a real comfort and joy to contemplate. When we appear before the judgment seat we shall be glorified, for that which is sown in dishonor is raised in glory, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 43, and we shall be like Christ. Not only that, but when we are raised, or caught up without dying, to meet the Lord in the air. It is said, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Not for one instant shall we be absent from him, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17. Wherever he is we shall ever be. But it may now be said to me, by this you seem to make it appear that every true believer shall reign with Christ. Yes, this is just what I see the scripture teaches. In that day there shall not be one bit of blame for any true saint of God. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And, in the dispensation of the fullness of times, when everything is gathered under Christ, we are to be, to the praise of his glory, and the earnest of that we have in the gift of the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. 9 to 14. We are also part of that building that is growing to a holy temple in the Lord. And if the Apostle has to warn the saints against the allowance of the fleshly will, he tells them that because of this the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience, that is, those that do not obey the gospel. He does not say, it comes upon them, Ephesians chapter 5 verses 3 to 8. The Colossians are said to have been reconciled in the body of Christ's flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if ye continue in the faith grounded and settled. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 to 23. Continuance proves the reality of their faith. Again, he says, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory, Colossians chapter 3 verse 4. The day of the Lord that shall come on all the world as a thief shall not come thus upon believers. He says, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. 
ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of the darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore comfort yourselves together, and edify one another, even as also ye do. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calls you, who also will do it, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 4 to 11, 23, 24. Again, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by the gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 13 to 14. Now in hope of this glory we rejoice, Romans chapter 5 verse 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 7 to 8, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 2 to 3. Now when shall the saints judge the world or angels, except at his appearing and kingdom? Perhaps you say, it does not say all the saints. Neither does it say all the world. It says, the saints, and it says, the world, and that without any qualification whatever. And was Paul dreaming when he said that the Lord would confirm the saints blameless in that day? And was it not true that the Thessalonians were called to the obtaining of the glory that shall be revealed in that day? And was it a promise never to be fulfilled, that God would preserve them, spirit, soul and body, blameless against that day? And shall that day overtake the saints as a thief, though they be not in darkness, but are children of light and of the day? Are these encouragements held out to the saints of God in this hostile world nothing but a pack of lies? We are told by certain teachers that Paul was not perfectly sure as to how he might stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Do they really study the scriptures? The truth is, that in contemplating that judgment it is not for himself he has the slightest fear. He was always confident. He says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11. When he views the searching character of that judgment, as it shall affect the works of believers, a powerful impression is conveyed to his mind of the terrible consequences to those who have to appear there in their sins. For whether it be designated the judgment seat or the great white throne, it is the same righteous person that shall judge, and where it is the judgment of persons the terror of its results for them is unspeakable. Hence he uses that judgment to get at the consciences of sinners and to wake them up. With Felix he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, until the Roman governor trembled with fear. But as to himself, he had not the slightest fear. How could he have fear when the rest of us have boldness for the day of judgment, and just because the work that has been done for us is infinitely perfect? That our sins are as completely gone as though they never had existence, and our relation with God are the same as his own, for as he is, so are we in this world, 1 John chapter 4 verse 17. This judgment had no terrors for the Apostle, and, thank God, it has none for the writer of this paper. Another thing I would refer my reader's attention to, we are members of the body of Christ. He is our risen and exalted head, and we are part of himself. Yet these teachers tell us that we may be during the time of his kingdom in the lake of fire. Just think of a part of Christ in the torment of Gehenna. And yet these wild and wicked notions are foisted upon the saints of God, and, alas, are in some instances gladly accepted as most precious truth. We learn in the word that he loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, and these men tell us that some of it shall be purged in the lake of fire. But now, by the help of God, I will seek to turn the attention of the reader to the promises made to the Father of the faithful, that we may see the bearing of those promises upon others than himself. Abraham was made the father of all them that believe, whether circumcised or uncircumcised, and the promise made to him was, that he should be heir of the world. And this promise was on the principle of faith, that it might be by grace, to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were, Romans chapter 4, and grace recognizes no merit in the recipient. 
Now these promises were established in Christ, Galatians chapter 3 verse 16, for all the promises are in him, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. Jew and Gentile are all concluded under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. And therefore is it stated, and if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise, Galatians chapter 3 verses 22, 29. Now none but sons inherit, and they inherit all things for they are heirs of God, and therefore, all things are yours, whether Paul, or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present. Or things to come, all are yours, and ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 21 to 23. And, how shall he not with him freely give us all things, Romans chapter 8 verse 32. Need I quote more scripture texts? If a man is not satisfied with the revelation given to us in the love of God, let him say so, and in the hand of God we can leave him. I have said servants do not inherit. It is only as sons that we are heirs of God, Galatians chapter 4 verse 30. In one way we are all servants of God, but not as servants are we heirs, but as sons. Nor have servants any security, except that which their faithfulness gives them. But no one who is not a son can be faithful, for only by love can God be served, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 to 3. The servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed, John chapter 8 verses 35 to 36. And the way in which he makes free is in sonship. And it is in this connection we have the exhortation, stand therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. The son is ever greater than the servant, for the son speaks of vital relationship, which the servant does not. A servant may be dismissed, and the master be done with him forever, but not the son, he abides in the house forever. This relationship cannot be broken. In grace God gives opportunity of serving him, and we delight to accept the privilege, but we do so because we are sons, and because we stand in higher relationship with him. We are sons, and by the spirit of his son call him father. The case of the wicked servant. Matthew chapter 25 verses 14 to 30 is adduced in this book to prove the assertion that not all true believers shall reign with Christ. It is admitted that the man who had five talents, and also the man that had two, shall reign with him, but that the man who had received only one talent shall not. Though the three are all servants of the Lord. Now this last mentioned servant brought forth nothing for his Lord from the talent that was given to him, and we learn from the parable of the sower, Matthew chapter 13. That where the seed of the word fell into good ground it brought forth, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. Every soul in whom there is a work of divine grace brings forth fruit, there may be little, or there may be much, but where life is there is activity. And the activity of divine life is the fruit spoken of, for the life the believer has received from Christ is in the power of the Holy Spirit. Love is one of the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians chapters 5 to 22, and where love is not God is unknown, 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 to 8. This wicked servant brought forth nothing and he knew not God. See the account he gives of him, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. Is that what God is? His own confession proved the darkness in which he was. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness, 1 John chapter 5 verse 19. On them that know not God, his vengeance shall fall at his appearing, and they shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 8 to 9. Such men as this wicked servant is shall meet the doom in that day. We are also referred to the faithful and wise servant in Matthew chapter 24 verses 45 to 51, and also the evil servant in the same place, and we are told that both these servants are one. Now if they both were one person he must be maintained in life throughout the whole dispensation, and Methuselah when he died would be, compared with him, only an infant. Today he would be almost 2,000 years old. The fact is, the whole dispensation is in view, and in the parable we are given to see the way in which the servants of the Lord have departed from himself. The servants that had a charge in the household of God were at the beginning of the dispensation faithful and wise, for they were directly under the eye of the apostles, and in most cases were appointed by them. But the profession did not long remain in its primitive freshness. Before the apostle John had left the world the church had left its first love, and from that day until the present it has gone on from bad to worse. We see the progress of its departure in the seven churches of Revelation. There we get a better insight into the history of the church than we could get in all the books that ever were written on the subject.
In the parable we see that which are servants of the Lord became while the church was running its course down through the centuries, from its establishment until it will become so nauseous to Christ that he says. I will spue thee out of my mouth, Revelation chapter 2 verse 3. It was not long until the servants had usurped the position of lords over God's heritage, 1 Pet, 5-3, and priests they styled themselves, as though all the saints of the Lord were not priests, 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 5, 9. Next, the formation of sects and parties and everyone seeking to get as many disciples as he could after himself. That all who take upon themselves the service of Christ must own him as Lord need scarcely be said, for otherwise he would have no right to call himself a Christian. But not all that call him Lord love either him or his service. There are many reasons why people enter that service. It is taken up by some as a respectable way of earning a living, by others for the purpose of gaining ascendancy over the souls of men. Not so many take it up out of pure devotedness to the interests of Christ. But those who take the place of his servants have the responsibility devolving upon the position, and may have a talent given to them to be used in their service for him. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, Matthew chapter 7 verses 22 to 23. The fact of their being servants of his and gifted with power to serve him does not prove them to be in vital relationship with him. These certainly were not, for he says, I never knew you. That he is omniscient and knows all men is just what the word says, John chapter 2 verses 24 to 25. But here it is knowledge involving intimacy in the divine life and nature. Jesus says, I know my sheep, and am known of mine, as the Father knows me and I know the Father, John chapter 10 verse 15. This is the intimacy that subsists between him and all his own, and outside of this is every other human being. The wicked servants are not in this fellowship. Apostles were specially called of God, and had their mission marked out for them by the Lord himself. These or the delegates ordained elders in all the Gentile churches, Acts chapter 14 verse 23, Titus chapter 1 verse 5. Others who were gifted by the Lord, evangelists and teachers, went forth in his service, and seemingly without any special call. But whether directly sent forth by the Lord himself, or whether addicting themselves to the ministry, all were directly responsible to him, with respect to the way in which they carried out the service they took up. Whatever they might be, they were his servants, and to him bound to give account. Nowadays we hear people talking about having a call to the ministry, and in association with this or that sect, and this call is supposed to be from the Lord but really it is more often from a congregation of unconverted men, and the man called anything but a child of God. But seeing they take this place, the Lord holds them to the responsibility of the position. There were such in the past dispensation, and of them he says, I have not sent these prophets, yea they ran, I have not spoken to them, yea they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way, and from the evil of the doings, Jeremiah chapter 33 verses 21 to 22. And Peter tells us that as there were false prophets among the people, so shall there be false teachers among you, who shall privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1. And Paul, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 13. Even Balaam, a servant of the devil, was taken up by God, and made to set forth the mind of God regarding his people Israel and that in the most glowing terms. Yet was he judged on account of his wickedness, Numbers 22-24, 31-8. But yet another question is raised, and 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is referred to, in which Paul speaks of the assembly at Corinth as God's building, and himself and Apollos as God's fellow workman, Paul, as a wise master builder, had laid the foundation of the assembly at Corinth. The foundation was laid in the souls of the saints, and it was Jesus Christ. Later on the apostle could say to these same saints, when he writes his second epistle to them, Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates, 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. The saints are the building, the servants are the workmen engaged on the building. These are not master builders, Paul was that, and the foundation was laid once for all. Those who follow in the work of the edifice need to be careful to build with material that will stand the test. The day of trial is sure to come, some day that shall test all that has been done, and the fire of that day shall destroy and bring to nothing everything that is inflammable, such as wood, hay, straw. There are many builders that build with bad material, turning saints and those that hear them to a sacramental system, the law, and a Christless ritual. 
these doctrines are worthless to produce or to build up believers, and the work of such builders shall be burned up, and they shall have no reward for their labor. But it does not necessarily follow that he shall be lost, his work shall be lost, but he himself shall be saved as by fire. The builder may be more than a builder, he may be a true saint of God, and in his life as a believer he may bring forth a good deal of fruit, but his service as a builder is lost. All saints are not builders in this sense, though in another sense all are, for we are exhorted to build up ourselves on our most holy faith, Jude chapter 20. But the passage under consideration is the work of a teacher on the saints viewed as God's building. Paul tells the saints that they were his glory and joy, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 19. And John, and now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming, 1 John chapter 2 verse 28. These faithful builders wrought so that they would find in the day of Christ the saints they sought to build up glorified with Christ. Lot lost everything that he possessed in Sodom, but his relationship with God remained uninjured. Scripture says of the bad builder, he shall suffer loss, and the loss is stated, and no one who fears God will add to his word. There is also the destroyer, or defiler, of God's temple, and him shall God destroy. The man who builds with good material shall have his reward. We are not told what his reward shall be. It will be reward enough for him, when he shall see those who have been built up by his faithful ministry in the glory with Christ. But let my reader keep in mind that the scripture referred to has for its subject teachers of the word, and not simply saints. A man might be a very godly saint, and yet very defective in the doctrine of Christ. Therefore he might be unintentionally building with material that in a day of trial would not stand. He might be a bad builder, but in his Christian life there might be produced much of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 to 23. I think I have seen such. But what about the Israelites who fell in the wilderness, and never reached the promised land? Are the things that happened to them not types of us? Certainly, the scriptures say they are types of us. Well, they had been all sheltered by the blood of the Lamb, they had been baptized to Moses in the cloud and in the sea, they had all eaten the same spiritual meat. They had all drunk the same spiritual drink, but not all entered Canaan. Why? Simply because they had no faith, Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 20, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 10, and because they refused to go into the land, Numbers chapter 14 verses 1 to 23. But we are told that Israel was standing in grace. The people were brought out of Egypt in grace, and stood in grace up till they came to Sinai, but there they came under the covenant of works, and from that day all was changed. They were placed under law with a little grace added, or none of them had left Sinai alive, Exodus chapter 19 verses 4 to 8, 20, 1 to 17, 34 to 6 minus 7. Had they known the deceitfulness of their own hearts they would never have put their signature to that covenant. But they did sign it, saying, all that the Lord has spoken we will do. No one can inherit blessing on the ground of the fulfillment of their obligations. But I am told, overthrown Israel are a type either of the believer's eternal destruction, or of his forfeited reward. There are three ways in which Israelites are types of Christians. One, as sheltered by blood in Egypt, but still in bondage, and viewing God as a judge. This is a soul in whom there is a work of grace, the blood of Christ giving a righteous ground of passing over those who have turned to him in faith, Romans chapter 3. But the soul not planted on the ground of redemption. 2. The profession of faith in Christ delivered for our offenses, and raised again for justification, Romans chapter 4 verses 24 to 25. This brings into the wilderness where the testing begins. If a soul has not genuine faith he will not go on in the face of difficulties, but in his heart he turns back into the world. This is eternal destruction. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip, for how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Hebrews chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. In chapter 12 verse 2, we are told there is no escape. Should one fall in the wilderness, and many fall there, his case is hopeless. Many are called, but few are chosen, Matthew chapter 20 verse 14. 3. The failure of the two and a half tribes to go over Jordan. The land given to them was from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates, Genesis chapter 15 verse 18, but their place of abode was on the west side of the Jordan. The territory on the east side was theirs, but they were not to have their home, but tribal inheritance in it. The two and a half tribes pleaded to be allowed to dwell in the land of Bashan, which was on the east of Jordan, and Moses allowed them to do this on the ground that they went across Jordan armed and helped their brethren against the inhabitants of Canaan. Now this represents many true believers who refuse to take the ground of heavenly men, but are content to remain down here as justified through grace, and in hope of the glory of God.
a large number of so-called evangelicals are in occupation of this ground. They are good men, and well able on certain occasions to contend for the faith and for the heavenly hopes of believers, but to take Ephesian ground, as risen with Christ, and seated in him in the heavenlies. From this they shrink. Those in Egypt have not reached salvation, those in the wilderness may or may not have a vital link with Christ. Those at home in Bashan have not accepted in any full measure the position into which they have been called by the gospel. We are not only going to heaven, but we are now a heavenly people, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 48. Unbelievers do not enter into the rest of God, we that have believed do, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 3.